Hello, oh, my name is Jim Hodges. I'm Research Director at Heavy Reading, and today I'm joined by Rick Fullweiler. Rick is the Chief Solutions Architect at Netscout. So welcome, Rick. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me today. So today we're going to be talking about 5G and service assurance. I mean, obviously 5G, it's really a game changer from a services and scale perspective, but it obviously has impacts on really all, all layers of the network from core to signaling control, but also service assurance. Obviously service assurance is important because of the new performance requirements associated with 5G services. So I'm just kind of wondering what are some of the top of mind impacts that you see that are that 5G is introducing from a service assurance perspective? Sure, Jimmy. I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, as we look at CARES migrating from a 5G non-standalone to a 5G standalone environment, there's a lot of dynamic changes going on almost simultaneously. And it is definitely a challenge from a service assurance perspective. You know, for example, we're seeing the heavy use of virtualization, everything moving from kind of a, uh, a, a non-virtualized environment to VMs now on containers. So that in itself provides one area that we have to be thinking about is how do we acquire the packets? And obviously, that's a very interesting subject for us, especially not only as we look at the acquisition of the packets, but the fact that the packets are now migrating now to an HTTP2 environment with header compression. And there's potential possibility now that a encryption, TLS 1.3 encryption, will be applied to. So that challenge can be overcome by a variety of different ways. You know, obviously, Netscout spent quite a bit of time on, on working with different types of vendors on packet acquisition. And we're also been uh, working around the, the capability to do the de-encryption too, either leveraging uh, cloud native service meshing or leveraging some of our own de-encryption capabilities ourselves. Along with that, some other challenges, and again, this is a lot of things changing simultaneously. Uh, we're not seeing the MZ any longer on the wire. So now we have to uh, consider the fact that the MZ, which is in the 5G world called the SUPI, is we have to be able to do some kind of cross-management mapping so we have to be able to manage the N12 interface to be able to see the SUPI, SUPI mapping. So that's another challenge for us. We're also seeing a lot of the, the data now migrating to the edge, where in the past it was actually housed in the core, and we could see that. So now we have the capability to go out into the edge and are the mech, if you wish, and being able to put lightweight probes to be able to see the traffic in the, that environment. And that in itself is also interesting because now we're seeing the, uh, the 5G starting to rely upon its ultra low latency and high bandwidth. So we're seeing carriers wanting to put uh, and partnering with, uh, with, say, cloud gaming manufacturers where they're putting the cloud gaming application in the cloud. So that in itself is introducing a whole uh, plethora of brand new service assurance metrics we have to be supporting because basically when you look at putting a, a gaming application in the cloud, obviously the users are expecting console-based type of experience. So we have to be able to monitor that. And beyond just the, the, uh, the edge itself, if we look at just the RAN, I mean, there's tons of different changes taking place in the RAN. You know, we're looking at virtual RAN, we're looking at open RAN, we're looking at the fact that now they're putting in RAN intelligent controllers, which is going to be introducing new performance metrics we're going to be seeing from service assurance. And along with that, there's even a new spectrum being introduced. You know, we're looking at the cable market, which is starting to now rely upon CBRS as a new spectrum that we also have to be supporting. And we're also looking at some of the challenges that are relates to how do we monitor the 4G and 5G together. For example, voice over the radio, falling back from 5G services to 4G services, a lot of correlation needs to be taking place too in that environment. So a lot of challenges, you know, obviously we're, we're addressing those challenges, but there's so much going on right now. It's, it's literally like changing almost all the tires on the car as it's moving down the, the road. Yeah, agreed. You're, you're absolutely right. New protocols, new core, new RAN, uh, new devices, new service, new service thresholds. Yeah, everything is really changing. Exactly. So, Rick, obviously, you, you talked about some of the impacts of 5G and really the, the broad spectrum of, of changes. And clearly, we know that machine learning and AI are really going to be partly foundational to helping evolve service, service assurance systems meet these, these basically 5G requirements. I'm just wondering, in your estimation, where are we in, in machine learning and AI integration cycles, and what are some of the challenges that kind of lay, lay ahead of us? So, so I think that that's a great question, Jim. In, in fact, uh, from our perspective, that's a major investment for us. Um, you know, obviously, NetScout's starting to leverage AI and ML technology um, as it relates to service assurance. But, you know, one of the things that we think we need to be smart about 
is not only just taking algorithms that are after the day and apply them into a 5G or kind of a telco kind of environment, but smartly apply them into what business cases we're trying to solve. In fact, if you look at um, some of the 3GPP documentation, especially release 16, they start to define this capability of using formula-based AI and ML technology for the MWDAF. It, it lists some very specific use cases, but what we don't want to do is we don't want to just build use cases to be building use cases. We want to have an interactive kind of conversation with carriers and try to understand how to apply the technology to how we solve real business problems. And at the same time, we want to make sure that when we do apply the AI and ML technology, it's very pliable. And again, it goes back to you know, what business problems we'll be trying to solve with the carrier. And in fact, if we can make the technology pliable enough that where they can go in themselves and then make the, the right changes or modify, say, the, the, the business logic or the chain logic in, in, in the AI ML engine, then they can actually create their own use cases at will. And this is kind of where we're taking it. In fact, you know, one of the things that we're looking at is, is how do we take our 30 plus man years of telecom experience and overlay that into uh, an environment where we can leverage the AI and ML technology. And think we, we've kind of cracked the code on that to some degree. You know, we, we have a new product called Omnis Analytics and it's allowing us to literally search through terabytes of data so we can look at and try to find outliers. You know, for example, if we're looking at an audio gap issue that uh, users are experiencing, you know, we can literally sift through that data and detect whether it's a RAN or a network infrastructure problem. And in fact, you know, we can actually go through kind of the checklist. It's kind of like taking your BMW and running in, into the, uh, the service shop. You put it on a computer, the computer goes down this checklist. We do kind of the, exactly the same thing, but using the AI and ML technology. So we can see that this audio potential gap problem is really not related to the RAN or the infrastructure. It's probably more an issue related to a firmware upgrade that a group of users just did on their Galaxy 21 about a week ago. So this allows us to, uh, to do this kind of root cause isolation and outlier detection. And this is where I think really we're, we're seeing kind of the AI and ML technology going is to do these, this, this kind of root isolation capability. And this is a very key area for us to start playing in. Yeah, interesting. Um, and just kind of extending that discussion related to services, you know, 5G service innovation is obviously and often tightly coupled with supporting capabilities like network slicing. There's a big push on network slicing um, related to the 5G core deployment. So, you know, it's clear that 5G slicing will introduce new services and therefore new service assurance requirements. Um, I'm just kind of interesting. You talk about AI and ML. What's kind of uh, what kind of slice-based service assurance um, impacts are you kind of focusing on as well? Right. So, so I, I, I think when we think about slicing, slicing is kind of a crawl, walk, run kind of environment. In fact, we, we, we talk to and work with a lot of carriers today, and you know, we're, we're seeing kind of one end of the spectrum to the other. We're seeing some carriers saying that you know, we're not really sure that slicing is mature enough. And we're seeing some carriers saying, hey, we'd love to have this nirvana to where we have this dynamic slicing. We have this elastic network to where we can do slicing on demand. We can scale up VMs. We can scale them down based upon the slicing. I think the latter is, is yet to come. It's going to take a little while to get there. But obviously, from assurance assurance perspective, you know, we, we see the slices. So we understand the fact that you're having a slice service type. So whether it's uh, enhanced multimedia broadband, it's you know, ultra low latency, it's, you know, it's massive IoT or it's vehicle to X communication, we'll, we'll see that and we'll be able to record that. But I think right now, you know, what we're doing is we're, we're seeing the slicing starting out as being kind of finite and that the slicing will be related to, you know, what, what each service that you want. And then over time, you'll, you'll kind of grow into this capability where you have this dynamic capability to dynamically spin up more AMFs, more UPFs, more uh, SMFs. And this is really where I think that AI and ML technology will come into. It'll look at, and again, we're looking at this today, it'll look at what services and what's the quality of service I'm providing by individual slice. It'll then make determinations based upon how the network slice selection function has, has segmented the slicing and say, either I need more capability, I need more UPF capability, or I need more SMF capability. And then the, the MWDF type of functionality will then communicate back to the PCRF, or in case of the 5G, the PCF, to make that dynamic instantiation of more services. 
But I really think, you know, today what we'll probably see it starting out is more related to the RAN. You know, I think the first part of it will be how do we address slicing issues on the RAN, especially like cell congestion, where we can actually make deterministic uh, views on whether or not a cell is congested or not, send information to a PCF to make the throttling decisions based upon the, how congested that particular cell is. That's kind of where we see it starting and then it migrating more later over the years to that more Nibbana kind of capability we have that really elastic kind of network related to slicing. Yeah, it's an excellent point because even though 5G core is service-based architecture and you talked about network slice selection functions, the as you said, the service has to has to basically um, migrate from the device through, you know, uh, the RAN to the core. So you're absolutely right. I guess you have to focus on on the RAN just to make sure you have enough capability to meet the requirements for the services as well. I want to finally talk about IoT. IoT is often tightly uh, coupled as well with 5G services. You know, we've been talking about billions of 5G and IoT devices being deployed in the last couple of years. And it's, you know, I don't think we've reached those numbers, but in reality, we're starting to see some IoT services on the uptake, and it's clearly something that we are going to have to address as we move forward as 5G networks uh, kind of become commercialized on a much larger scale. Um, I guess from a service assurance perspective, is is it I, IoT really more, is it only really, I guess, a an impact because of the number of devices, or is there much more complexity in that from a service assurance, uh, in a ser service assurance context? Right. I mean, th there's no doubt about it. I mean, the fact that you will have tremendous new devices hitting the network I, it is obviously going to be an interesting challenge from a service pers uh, insurance perspective. I think one of the things that, that, that we look at is, again, it goes back to the, the business aspect of these IoT devices. Um, some IoT devices only report maybe you know once a day, once a week, once a month, depending on some of them are going to have tremendous amount of data depending upon uh, the use case for those particular IoT devices. And this is where we work very closely with the carrier in terms of how we prioritize which ILT devices we really want to put the focus on. If it's, if it's obviously driving critical business back to the carrier, then those are the ones we really want to focus on as, as being critical to look at. And another thing that we're looking at from IoT devices, which is a very interesting kind of turn on service assurance, is the fact that you look at some of the key tenants of 5G, like the ultra low latency and the high bandwidth capability, what we're seeing now is IoT clustering starting to take place to where they're doing massive DDoS attacks through the network. And this is a very unique anomaly that we're starting to start to pick upon is from a service assurance perspective, how do we detect this? How do we detect the fact that the device has been over the last, say, several months has been producing over a few megabytes and all of a sudden within the next hour or two, you know, it goes and starts ramping up to gigabytes per hour. And this is the anomalies that we're really starting to look for. We're looking for the fact that things that don't trend normally, we see these kind of outliers, we see these kind of out of trend kind of anomalies. This is where we start detecting potentially this could be a security risk through the network. Not only using a network as a transport, but, but potentially actually going and attacking the physical components inside of the network. And that's another key area that we're starting to really look at from service assurance. Security is obviously going to be a huge impact. It'll have a huge impact on how service providers actually manage and monitor their network as they go forward. So, Ricky, a really interesting discussion. It's it's clear that there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of opportunities and, and challenges from a service assurance perspective related to 5G. But obviously, we're going to be addressing those as the industry moves forward and we and we monetize and commercialize these networks on a uh, much wider scale. So there's going to be a lot more discussion, I'm sure, about 5G service assurance in the near future. And thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. Thanks for the time.